Good. Uh, first John last week and uh, we might as well do the last the last letters of St. John the Divine as they call him or John the Beloved a lot of people get John the Baptist mixed up with this character and uh, even in doing some research online John the Baptist kept popping up so you have to really narrow your search to really what you're looking for or you'll get the wrong information. Uh, so we'll review last week. No, we won't, because we finished last week. So we have uh, on page 1326 and 1327, you have the last two little letters of first and second John, I mean second and third John, Pardon me. So, Lord, we're asking you now to guide us into these uh, six verses here tonight. And so, so much he's trying to say uh, as an old man, but he's of keen mind. And so, help us, Lord. We like to live that way as well. If we get older, we still have a keen mind. Sort of like Caleb in the Old Testament, 85 years old and going strong. So we ask you now to help us to grow in the Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have these, uh, 2 John, verse 1 to 6. We're going to talk about this 2 John book here. And uh, it's a lot of interesting things. Some people think this was not this John, some other John, but really... When you finally get all the information in, it is the same John. He wrote five books, three First John of Revelation and St. John. And so uh, it, the evidence is overwhelming. You get into liberal theologians that, and, and there's no such thing as a theologian anyway, just some person that tries to study the Bible. And... Uh, Brother Dunn and I were talking about some of the exaggeration, exaggerations that people invent to get a stir online. And uh, did you know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was, uh, had Jesus at 12 years of age? And, and that Joseph was 90 years old and he was a pedophile? Did you know that? Well, I found it out on the, online today. And they said that, that this... Social media is abuzz with this this new discovery of heresy. Yeah. Well, guess what? That sounds outrageous, but that's exactly what Second John is all about, and Third John is about deviating from the truth. That's why he's trying to. When he dies, he wants everybody to be centered on the Bible, truth of the Bible, not what they heard or people will buy. I mean, there's millions of Christian books out there that are being read by people that don't even read their Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And the radio stations, they wait for to be spoon-fed on the radio or, or TV with a sermonette. So we're going to see three things here. It's hard to outline, and it has been. Probably one of the most difficult to just keep it in its context as you go verse by verse. It's, uh, like I said, he's an old man with a lot to say before he disappears. And he's been punished, of course, for being this wonderful Christian leader. So we see here, we're going to see the who of the last letter of John. Then we're going to see the what of the last letter of John. Then we're going to see the how of the last letters of St. John. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the who. Look at verse 1a. Just a little sliver, it introduces us to who is writing and who is being written to. And it says the, the blank who? The elder. Now that doesn't mean it's an old businessman that wants to be a deacon in a big church. It's not just an old fogey. This is a pastoral 
designation like bishop. Peter said he was an apostle, but he also said he was an elder, which also meant a, who was the first pastor of the church Jesus built? It was a pat yeah, Jesus told him, you're gonna, this is, I mean, you're, this is your job. Peter was an elder, he was also an evangelist as well. And who did Peter turn over the Jerusalem church to? James. Who? James. James, in chapter 15, you found that. He was an elder, but they were apostles as well. The elder unto the, starts with an E, the elect lady and her children. So we see here the elder is John, and he's writing it to the elect lady and her children. Now at the cross of Jesus, Jesus told John to take care of who? Mary. Okay, some have thought that this is who he's writing to is the mother of Jesus. And uh, it's speculation. It's, it can't be true though. So we have John, we have the lady, we have the elder, we have the lady, we have her children. So the elder is writing this to the elect lady. Well, guess what? John's about how old when he writes this? How old do you think he is? About 90. Well, Mary's already been dead for several years. She, she lived, I mean, the numbers fluctuate, but overall, Mary lived to be about 60 years of age. So he's 90, so she's, he's not writing to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And all her kids are as old as John is. So throw that out. But I was amazed how much time they put into the research and speculation that he's writing to Mary, uh, the mother. Now, how was Mary when she died? Around 60. Well, guess what? Mary never died. How many know that? The Catholics say that she was caught up to heaven. She has never died. And she never had any other kids besides Jesus. That's, the, that's what the Catholics teach. I mean, that's, that's their Mary. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners in the hour of our death. Amen. I mean, that's, that's the last rites you call on Mary to get you in. So it's not, it's, it's actually he's writing to a local church, the Bride of Christ, and her children, which are the members of that church. So unto the elder, uh, the elder unto the lady, elect lady, and uh, her children. Now verse 13 closes out the book, look what it says there. The children of thy elect, which is changed it now, Sister, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. It's one congregation sending greetings to another congregation. We have sister churches in town, do we not? Berean Baptist is, is one. South Campbell Avenue, there's many on Ozark Baptist Church, uh, Bible Baptist, they're sisters. And so you have to understand uh, this is written some say A.D. 90, some say A.D. 95 or 96. So we have the, uh, the timeline, and, and, and now we have missionaries in China, some around, been in Russia, and uh, Islamic nations, and they, they tell you, please do not share this letter with anybody online, because they may be stalked on their email in, in a country that hates God or Islamic or, or communist country, and they can be jailed or thrown out of the country. This is what I think we're looking at here is that he's writing in code because he was under, what's, the, what's that, the, one of the meanest emperors that ever ruled Rome. 15 years, Domi, 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 Domitian, how do you say it? Domitian, right? Is that, is that the guy's name? Domitian? Anyway, he is the one who put John 
on the Isle of Patmos. And uh, he was hated, and he, he, he arrested anybody for blinking the, the wrong eye. I mean, he was so brutal. And so John was, how long do you think John was on the Isle of Patmos? Anybody know? No more than three years, because Domitian, am I getting the name right? Domitian. What is it? Well, you know who I'm talking about, right? Okay, well anyway, D-O-M-A-T-I-O-N, I think it was I-A-N. But we have Domitian, he took over and he was going to make sure that John could not be heard or influence anybody, so he sent him to the Isle of Patmos. Well, guess what? Uh, God says, ye that forget God, what does he warn him there in the book of Psalms? Lest I tear you in pieces, right? The Mason was stabbed, executed in his own chambers, along with one of the servants. And it, it says there in the report that he was so dumbfounded that this could happen to him, the emperor of the Roman Empire, that one servant person could do this to him. Well, when, when he cried out, the rest of the staff came in and they actually hacked him to death. It says that's what it says. They all came in and hacked him to death. And guess what happened? <clears throat> John was immediately turned loose from Patmos so he could go back to Ephesus where he was the pastor of that church. He died about three years later. Well, we don't hear that. You have to go really do Bible study to, to come up with the dates and the people and the places. And that takes some time. So the who is of the last letter of John here is the elder to the lady which we believe to be the local church and her children. <clears throat> and uh, you know, D-O-M-I-T-I-N, Domitian, yeah. Now quickly, uh, <clears throat> look at Revelation 2 verse 1. We talked about the elect sister, sister church, and talking in code, but in Revelation chapter 2, what is the first church we see written to? Ephesus. Ephesus. And who was the pastor of Ephesus church? It's actually John. But look what he says about unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Now the subject of, he wrote second, first, second, and third John in Ephesus when he got off the aisle, but he wrote Revelation while he was on the Isle of Patmos. So he's talking about the love of the truth and love for the truth. But then he says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast done what? You've, lost your, you've left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from... So he tells them you've been... You, you've, you've stood your ground, you've stood your ground, you've stood your ground, that's good, but somewhere along the line you've lost the love of Christ. So we're going to see what Second John teaches here. And so, nevertheless, you've lost the first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick or your church out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast said, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This is the people he's fighting in, in Second and Third John and warning about in First John, about Christ not coming in the flesh, but, but Jesus coming. And we'll study that next time. It's called uh, 
Docetism, I believe is we'll we'll catch that next 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 lesson, Docetism, okay. which means the word docet means it it as it appears, like a vision, or today we call it a hologram. How many know what a hologram is? They have entertainers and Elvis and all these old people on stages. People pay to go see them. It's not really them. It's a figment of your imagination on stage called a hologram. They can do it in the air. They, they can duplicate all kinds of stuff in the air with a hologram. So anyway, we see that he's writing the first church here is uh, to the church he actually was the pastor of for many, many years. I think Mary was with him for 14 years after Jesus died, before she died. So uh, we see the who of the last letter of John the Beloved. Now secondly, let's go back and look at uh, the what. So what's the letter about? So we know who it's to, who it's from. And two, we see the what of the last letters of St. John. So we pick up from verse 1b to who, now we find out what he, he, he's writing for, and up to verse 4. Whom I love in the truth. Now the what is the word truth? That's what he's writing for, about standing for the truth. Whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Verse 2, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us how long? Yeah, when you're saved, the truth. Well, what did Jesus say? I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. So, I mean, if you're saved, you're saved. If you're not saved, you get, need to get saved. Which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Then he goes on, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God. It's a, uh, a greeting here. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. Now the truth is the subject here. Let's go over to Proverbs 23, 23, and quickly see a couple of verses. We know what Jesus said about that. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. I mentioned this many times in the last 36 years. It just says something about the truth. What does it say? Pull your wallet out. Get your money in. Get your money ready. Buy the truth and sell it not. Six words with the word and in between those three words on each side. Also, he says, buy wisdom, also wisdom, and buy instruction and understanding. But first, buy the truth and sell it not. So, no matter how much it costs to have truth, pay the price. It'd be a bargain. No matter how high the cost, he doesn't say if it's a two-for-one special, if you have a coupon. Just get it. Buy the truth. No matter how high the price. Then it changes and sell it not. No matter how low the circumstance in your life, never sell it. Never sell out. Never. They're just throwing the truth away now. They don't even... They can, they don't even sell it. So no matter how much it costs you to get the truth and, and live the truth, it's, it's always a bargain. And then when you have these low-down situations and temptations and uh, doctrinal challenges, never sell it. It's the most valuable thing you have is the truth. And then also wisdom, which we're told to pray for wisdom. I find that if we don't stay on top of that, we become dumb. James says, if any man lack wisdom, what? Yeah, ask God for it. But we don't do that. We ask God for everything else but wisdom. We wonder why we remain kind of dumbed down. 
wisdom and then instruction and then understanding. So this is an important verse. I pondered that first statement there for some years, but this the way to boil it down is the way it's written. Buy the truth, sell it not. Now over in 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> lastly here, chapter 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse number 8, it says, how many know that you can't change truth? I mean, is gravity always going to be pulling us down? Is that the truth? Is fire always going to burn stuff up? I mean, there's certain things that, that will never change. And so it says here, Paul's talking about being accused of not being a, a good preacher, apostle, whatever. But here, he's talking about, he just out of nowhere, he pulls this in verse 8, 13 verse 8. Read it with me. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. No matter how much we doubt the truth, it doesn't change a thing. The truth is always going to be the same. That's why Jesus said he was the truth. Because he's the same, what, yesterday and today and forever. Unchangeable truth. For we can do nothing against the truth, but we can do something for the truth. We can exhibit that in our life. And... Uh, <clears throat> The truth is, is the Bible. How many know that? We have all kinds of law books. We have all kinds of libraries and thousands of writings of good people. But none of them is as true as our Bible. And that's why the devil wants to water it down. He wants to try to change the truth, ease the truth. How many know the truth hurts sometimes? But how many know the truth cures all of our ills as well? So we've seen the who of the last letters of, of St. John, the elder to the lady, to her children, and then again the greetings from the sister church, as we suppose. <clears throat> then we saw the what of the last letter. It is the truth. Well, now, thirdly and lastly, we see the how of the last letters of St. John. How do we, how do we use the truth? We have it, but how do we use it? And he tells us that as we go back and look at verse 5 and 6. So we've seen verse 1, verse up to 4. Now we have verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that that which we had from the beginning, that we do what? love one another so we have the truth but we better have love in front of the truth i mean paul wrote a chapter 13 of first corinthians on the most important thing in our life what is that it is the love of god so that's what he says here that we love one another now verse one mentions the, the love <coughs> Look what it says, the elder unto the elect lady, whom I what? Whom I love in the truth. So we have love in front of truth here. Now verse 3 is interesting. Grace be with you. What's first? Mercy. You, how come it's not truth? Well, mercy is before truth. And peace, that's before truth. From God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and what? Truth and love. So that's how we administer truth. That's why that woman caught in the act of adultery wasn't stoned on the spot. Actually, she wasn't stoned at all after Jesus showed up. And uh, in other acts of mercy. So it tells us four things in verse 3. Mercy, peace, and then we have tr truth and love, okay? So verse five and verse number six, look at six. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that 
and as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So <clears throat> he says, don't ever forget that the first thing we have to deal with is love, not the truth. Go to Ephesians 4.14, a couple of verses there. Ephesians 4 and 14. And it says here in 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking what? The truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So he says, don't be an airhead. Don't be caught up in all these following the newest rage, the newest popular, Christ, even the Christian, like buying the newest book and the wristbands, what would Jesus do, and the Jabez prayer books, and all the, they come up with some new thing to make millions of dollars off of sucker Christians. Amen. Thank you, Brother Norwood. So, so 14 and 15 tells us, speak the truth in love. So there we have it. what we have from Paul, we have here from John as well. Mercy, peace, truth, love. Why are you close? Hang the left and go to Galatians 5 and verse 5. Uh, yeah, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, 14 and 15. 5, 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, free in Christ, free not to sin, of course. Only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, like the modern churches are doing, but by, here we what? But by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Brother Reeves and I were talking about churches that have been destroyed by mouthy Christians starting something in the churches. And that's they started picking at each other until there was nothing left. Both the churches we're talking about have split all the pieces you know, through the years. And it just started with people not speaking the truth in love. And... Uh, like we see here, love one another. So uh, <clears throat> we have the how of the last letters of St. John. And that is to always make sure that mercy and peace and love are in front of the word truth. The, the letter of the law killeth. Now we, some people like the law because it's exact. It tells you thou shalt not, thou shalt. But that, those kind of people have no mercy for anybody. And if it was them, they would first thing they would want is mercy from somebody else, yeah. not the guillotine. Now, <clears throat> turn to Psalm before we finish here, Psalm 85, 10. We're going to read two verses. But you have to understand, in the Old Testament, all of these are Old Testament verses, and each one, is, it uses the word mercy before truth. Mercy before truth. Mercy before truth. I mean, the Old Testament is, is hard on sin, but it's always filled. 19 references, if you want them, I'll give them to you. But let's go to Psalm 85, and uh, we see just one powerful one here. Psalm 85 and verse number 10. Read it with me. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Isn't that sweet? Then he goes on. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. But you see, 19 verses tell us mercy is always first before the word truth. Because that is the attitude we have to have in working with people. We have to have a loving attitude to work with sinners. Love your enemies? Well, Islam certainly doesn't live up to that one. 
the first thing they do is exterminate their enemies. And then 86.15 says, but thou, read that with me, 86.15, but thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. See that? There it is again. And so all the way from Genesis 24, 27, 1 Kings, uh, many, many of the Psalms, Psalm 57, 98, 105, Isaiah, Micah, 2 Samuel, <clears throat> and the rest are all in the Psalms. And I, I don't know that I've met any or heard any sermons on that, but I, as in my studies through the years, I said, man, why haven't I heard that in fundamentalism? It's always the truth. Well, that's the truth. That's the truth, brother. I mean, off with their heads, right? Sounds like, who, who said that? Some famous woman in Cinderella? <laughs> off with their heads. That's an easy answer. So we've seen the who is from John to the local church. And uh, then the what is, is truth. We must contend for the faith. Now, when we go into verse 7 next time, it will be how to deal with these people and the uh, doctrine of their day, the heresy called docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. Because up till now, I haven't run across that on why he was warning about the big deal about Jesus coming in the flesh and so I said, oh, wow, that's, these people, that's all they believe. Is. Everything is a vision and a dream, and it's just a figment of your imagination, and that had gotten into the churches. And John says, it ain't going to live around here. And it even, of course, he was put on Patmos because he was the number one contender for the truth. He was not a he, How many apostles are alive when he wrote this? Zero. He's the last man standing, so it's very important that we, we understand how the first century was closed out, begging us to, to learn how to love, but also never compromise the truth. So Lord, we thank you for the time that we've had uh, in this short segment tonight. We do ask you to help us be loving people and very truthful. And so we know you'll bless us for that. And save somebody even on the filming tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, it's 8 o'clock, and we're going to have our prayer time. I'm going to ask Brother Reeves if he would uh, take take that up for us tonight. And uh, also, he'll give you a little... He talked to his Uncle Danny down from Mexico today for, what, an hour and a half? That was wonderful. Give us a little rundown. on Danny's coming back maybe first of the year to see us from down at the border. Yeah, I finally was able to get through. Sometimes it's hard to get through to him because of all the things that uh, he's involved in and traveling all the time every weekend. 